Welcome to the People Who Read People podcast, hosted by me, Zachary Elwood. This is a podcast about better understanding why people do the things they do. You can learn more about it at behavior-podcast.com. On today's episode, I talk to Brandon Shields. His last name is spelled S-H-E-I-L-S. Brandon is a professional poker player who recently did a scientific study of poker tells. We talk about the challenges with studying poker tells, the structure of Brandon's study, and why he set it up that way, what the study found, some talk about general scientific concepts, some speculating on what AI and machine learning approaches might hold for analyzing poker behavior in the future, and then at the end we talk about some poker hands where Brandon used behavior in his decision process. If you didn't already know, my main claim to fame is that I'm the author of some respected books on poker tells. My first book, Reading Poker Tells, has been translated into eight languages. I'm most proud of my second book, Verbal Poker Tells, which attempts to find the hidden meanings in the things poker players often say during poker hands. If you'd like to learn more about that work, you can go to readingpokertells.com. And you might also enjoy a previous episode of this podcast where I talk to Dara O'Kearney about poker tells. My work on poker tells is what led Brandon Shields to reach out to me when he was starting work on his study. I helped him a bit in brainstorming the setup of the study, the criteria of what poker hands would be included, and the behaviors he'd be examining. And I helped him a bit in going through footage and finding poker hands that met the criteria that he'd later be logging. A little more about Brandon and his work. He's a professional poker player and coach who plays both online and live. He has a poker-focused YouTube channel. The channel name is Brandon Shields. If you're curious about his poker tournament scores, you can check out his profile on hendonmob.com. That's a site that tracks tournament results. His Twitter handle is Brandon Shields. Brandon did his poker tells research as part of his pursuing a master's degree in psychology at the University of Nottingham. That study is not yet published. One thing that might be important to emphasize before the interview is that good poker players are generally only infrequently basing decisions on poker tells. I want to emphasize this because I think the importance of poker tells can be quite exaggerated in the public's understanding based on depictions of poker in movies like Rounders or James Bond movies things like that. The ability to read poker tells well has been called the icing on the cake by some poker players in terms of it being much less important than having a strong strategy. Poker is a tremendously complicated game. It's a much tougher to solve game computationally than chess and strategy is so much more important than reading tells. In my poker tells books, I give the estimate that being strong at reading poker tells might add anywhere between 1-15% to to a live poker player's win rate. Put another way, you can be a hugely successful professional poker player without ever thinking about poker tells. As someone who considers himself quite good at reading tells, if I were playing a full day of poker against somewhat decent players at decent stakes, I might base a decision on a tell only a few times during that session, with some of those spots being pretty small decision points early in a hand, like whether to raise or fold preflop. I like to emphasize all this because I think for a lay audience, there can be exaggerated perceptions about poker tells and how often good players are using them. And all this is especially relevant for what Brandon and I talk about regarding his study. Okay, here's the talk with Brandon Shields. Hey, Brandon, thanks for coming on. Hi, Zach. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining me. And I guess we'll start with uh, maybe you can go into a little bit about how you got interested in poker and maybe go into how you've uh, gotten to playing for a living and what led to your interest in doing this study. I know that's a lot of questions I just threw out there, but <laughs> maybe, maybe a brief summary of, of that. Yeah, stuff. Try and, I'll try and condense uh, my life from poker into a, succinct as a, a paragraph as I can, I guess. Um, I've always been interested in strategy games. So growing up, I'd play like different card games and different games that were more into around trying to out strategize your opponent. Uh, and then my parents, played poker for a living when I was um, between when I was very young. Um, my first memory of this is when I was seven or eight and they'd play in like home games sometimes or I'd see them playing on TV. So I knew poker as a game, we'd play as a family at home sometimes and I wasn't like super into it, but I enjoy playing as a family and like strategy elements and obviously I was, I was clearly very bad at it compared to two professional players and my brother who's four years older than me. So I think 
that kind of started my interest. I used to watch the World Series on TV, and I liked the idea that I could watch these people playing for a lot of money. It seemed like infinite money at the time, um, and I, I could spot mistakes mm -hmm. people were making on TV at the time when I was seven or eight years old. And then I started to play um, like home games and pub poker games, and I, I would win. <laughs> Like against my 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 dad's friends, even maybe they're like drunk people at the pub or whatever. But uh, I like I didn't understand variance at the time either. It was possible. I was just super lucky. But it felt like I was making good decisions, and they were making very bad decisions already at like the start of playing poker. Mm -hmm. And I was getting money for this at an age where even twenty pound is infinite money, or, or like for twenty five dollars uh, is, mm -hmm. is going to be infinite money at that age. So I didn't I didn't play it too much as I was growing up because there's no opportunity, obviously. But if there was a home game or a pub poker game and I could play, I'd, I'd gravitate towards that. And then um, my brother became a professional player when he was 18 or 19 or as he was finishing uni. And that was when I was still underage because he's three or four years older. But that, again, continued my interest. My family have made a living at, at this all at different points. Um, and then I went to the casino for my 18th birthday um, pretty much <laughs> during during like um, that period of time. I was doing my, my A-levels, which is the the exams that get you into uni in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. And it was like the most important study phase effectively. And I would bring my A-level revision to the casino and do it like between hands. Because <laughs> I was that um, I was that interested in just playing as much poker as I possibly could. And uh, it went it went pretty well. And then um, I've kind of had an off on relationship with it uh, and having a normal career. And I enjoyed the fact that when I, I eventually ended up doing a psychology master's for, for lot, probably lots of reasons that I could combine my blood for poker with creating a study of my own and uh, mm -hmm. I have a lot of passion for psychology, I have a lot of passion for poker and it seemed like the, the natural culmination that I'd, I'd end up doing this study. Mm -hmm. So maybe before we get uh, too much into the the details of the study, maybe you can talk a little bit about the difficulty of setting the study up and the difficulties you ran into of trying to study poker tells in a scientific manner what, what stands out as the as the major obstacles you encountered yeah so the most forefront problem is is creating uniformity across what we're measuring because if you try and measure turn decisions or anytime someone bets or times where someone has 10 big blinds or 20 big blinds there's so many different factors in poker where the decision making process is completely different so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be kind of right to compare them um, so first was picking one specific area of poker where there'd be a lot to learn from, but also a lot of data available. So the first hurdle I met, because I, I allocated straight away that as soon, when someone bets the river, this is the point when they're waiting for their opponent to make their decision. The voice in their head is either saying, please call or please fold. As I thought, that's, that's going to be the perfect point. But mm -hmm. it just wasn't possible to get data on that area because all of the, well, not all, but m the majority of the stream data footage for poker is they'll they'll keep the camera on whoever's turn it is and then as soon as it swaps turn it will, the majority of the time it will be on that player and as soon as the camera swaps once or twice it, as soon as you've sort of lost some data it's just too hard to to have a uniform sample based on that so sometimes i would it would go back and forth a little bit but because it would swap at different rates and sometimes it wouldn't swap at all it it just wasn't going to be possible to get data for post bet river analysis and i think that would have been the most ideal so mm -hmm. that was the first big obstacle and that's why i ended up doing um pre-bet if that's if that's the right word on the river and i just this, i tried to determine like being a poker player myself what are the exact situations where there's the most pressure and therefore the most uh in theory would be given away uh, based on what, what i've read obviously about human psychology if someone if someone is betting one big blind on the flop they're just i think you wrote about this in your book as well like that it's just going to be a completely different subjective experience for them because the risk reward like in theory they they don't necessarily care that much if, if it doesn't work yet because they can bluff later or they can give up and it's a small pot but um mm -hmm. so i decided to choose uh parts that were at least 10 big blinds and um i just looked at tournaments just because that was uh that's the uniformity that i went mm -hmm. for there as well i could just look at cash games i think that that would be interesting as well and i thought once the part is at least that big and it's a river decision, that's that's a good starting point to say they're going to care about the result of this bet and therefore they, they're they going to have to either try and balance their emotions a lot more. People are going to take longer to make their decisions. It's sort of, it's just a more important decision for both both players. Mm -hmm. So I think that was that was nice to hone in on. Yeah, the the footage issue is a is a big problem and that's something I've dealt with a lot because I've you know created my PokerTales video series and ideally 
you know, you, you would have those um, post bet spots, those, those uh, spots after someone's made yeah. a significant bet. So um, yeah, I, I think it was a, it was a great decision you made to focus on that slightly before bet. And then the, the actual like during bet as they're placing the bet, because those are usually things the camera stays on them for is like, you know, when it, when it starts their turn, the camera's on them. And then up until they place the bet, the camera's on them typically for that stretch mm -hmm. of time. So that all made a lot of sense. A small edit here. Brandon took a while to explain all the various elements he had logged for the experiment. There were 22 factors in all, but to speed this up a bit, I'll just name a few of the specific verbal and nonverbal behaviors that he logged. One was the amount of time a player thought before betting. Another behavior was the amount of time a player spent placing a bet once they either declared the bet or started putting together the bet. Another behavior was whether the bet was verbalized or not. Another behavior was whether the player looked back at their whole cards before placing their bet. Another behavior was whether the player was playing with their chips or not. Again, that was just a few of the aspects that Brandon logged. Another aspect of Brandon's study that made a lot of sense was in how he approached ranking whether a better's hand was a bluff or a value bet. And a value bet is a way of saying that it's done for value with a hand that will usually be the best hand. In other words, a value bet is not a bluff. Brandon sent each hand in the study to several skilled poker players who then rank the hand as either a value bet or a bluff. This was an improvement on a method of categorizing hand strength that Michael Slepian had done in his poker behavior study. In that study, they'd apparently, from what I could tell, relied on the on-screen percentage graphics, which are displayed beside a player's hand graphics. Those graphics show the likelihood of a player's hand winning. It does this by comparing it to the opponent's known hand. This makes it a pretty bad way to categorize whether a player believes they're betting a weak hand or a strong hand. In other words, a player could have a hand they believe will tend to be a winner, but in that specific hand, their opponent happens to have an even stronger hand. In that instance, the first player's strong hand would be presumably classified as a bluff. I confess I'm not sure if there was some way sleppy and adjusted things to account for that, but my understanding was based on reading their paper, so it's possible there was more to it. But in any case, Brandon's decision to get skilled players to rank hands as either bluffs or value bets makes a lot of sense and may, I think, be the best way to easily make that categorization. Okay, back to the interview where Brandon talks about this a little bit more. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, I think it was your critique of that past study that helped me get, get onto that. So thank you as well. Oh, that's awesome. So let's see. Uh, after naming all of those factors that you looked in, it might be anticlimactic that didn't say, uh, what were the, what were your findings? Uh, essentially that there was none of these factors alone were statistically significant. And that does not mean that they aren't potentially significant with a bigger sample, but with the sample I had, and uh, some of these factors didn't actually occur that often, even though obviously I tried to measure all of them, but it's not actually that often that someone double checks their cards. If I, uh, if I find the exact number here, um, we had in the 400 and 24. <laughs> yeah, to only 24 times someone double check their cards and four times um, it couldn't be determined based on um, like where the camera was or, or something else. So mm. 20, 24 out of 416 is, is a really small amount. And you'd need, even though uh, the, if you looked at the ratio there, it would look like it is statistically significant to it, to the human eye, just based on uh, the maths behind figuring out statistical significance. It has to be, the confidence rate is 95%. We have to be able to say with 95% certainty that it's the case that this makes this more likely. And, we just didn't have the sample. Mm -hmm. And I, I think if with a bigger sample, I'm, I'm quite sure that that would have been significant. That gets into a question I have, uh, just a general scientific question, which is when I see a study that says this wasn't statistically significant, is, is my takeaway supposed to be that just that the study cannot tell that? Because sometimes I feel like it's framed as if like it's not there, there's no correlation, but maybe that's just a misreading on my part and should the takeaway for me be the study can just not determine that G generally yes it's it's like saying we we failed to prove it it doesn't mean that it's not true uh, mm, okay but it, okay. it it depends on the data the like the the actual science that went into it so if, if i had a sample here of a hundred thousand it'd be pretty hard to argue with it um assuming that my practice and how i recorded data is fine which is, is kind of a whole nother ball game but it, it is determined by there's something called statistical power, which uh, generally you want to get to a 
above a rate of like 0.8 and it's determined by basically the sample size and uh, so some studies are going to have really good statistical power and they'll talk about that and if they've got good power and they've got good science behind what they did like for example if, if you don't use the equity <laughs> in, in our case because that that's kind of a flaw in the science uh, if you've got good power and you've got which is due to the good sample and you've got good science then it's pretty hard to argue with but you still can't say for sure that it's false you can only say that with all of this it's not true and it's 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 almost as good as sometimes if, if there's enough data there so it might be getting too far in the weeds and and if it is feel free to say but for that say we were looking at that double checking whole cards before a bet behavior how much more data do you think you need to be able to confidently say like there's no correlation there if that makes sense well i can tell i, I ran the statistical power test on the sample that i would need total but i didn't run it on individual factors so the the initial based on the time frame that i had i only had like a month, a month or two of collecting data, it was. Mm -hmm. It would have been impossible for me to get um, true statistical power on all of these individual factors, just because they're so infrequent. I knew that some of them would hit the benchmark, some of them wouldn't, and it's just it's kind of a starting point. I'd like it's better I recorded it than, than not, but it didn't mm -hmm. become the main focus of the study as as good as it would be to have more data on them. Uh, so to answer your question about the amount, bear in mind we had twenty twenty four where it was true across um, three hundred and ninety two. Uh, I'd have to plug it into like a statistical uh, computer to, to, run, to run all the exact equations. But I believe if we had, um, in fact, to be honest, it, it, it is, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to make any false claims by coming up with an exact number, but 24 out, out of, out of that is, is, is very small. Hmm. So hmm. I, I would imagine based on the ratio we've got, I'd need at least 4,000 data points, um, maybe hmm. more. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, I think it really shows the <laughs> the difficulty in this because I, th I think, uh, I was going to say too, I, I think some people would would uh, expect me to be like disappointed or, or surprised by not finding anything. But, I, and actually the, these things are so hard to study because, you know, as you say, like you collected 400 hands and only in a few of those hands is each behavior that you're, that you're studying found, which means you got to get a lot more hands to find a lot of those behaviors. And then you've even got more complexity too, because you've got the fact that the situational context is important. Like you named a few of the factors involved, uh, but there's the fact that skilled players can behave quite differently from uh, recreational players. And most tells are found from more recreational players. So there's even this thing of like, if you were able to like zero in on the, uh, on the on the more recreational players and like chop out the pro players, then that would also be an interesting way to analyze it. And th this is just to say that there, th this is massively complex to study these things. And I actually had considered setting up a a local game to try to study this study this myself because they had poker rooms there, and I thought about putting some effort into it. And I was like, I started thinking about the same things that you're thinking about here, where I was like, this would take me this would be like a, a life's work almost. And I would have to invest a lot of time to really, to do this right, you know, and then I would still be left with these things where I'm like, uh, I'm still running into these situational factors where these, you know, they, they, there's so many uh, things to take into account. And it was kind of just really uh, probably what you ran into yourself actually doing. It was like, it's uh, kind of daunting to, to set it up and, and to try to distinguish like, to, to get the situation down to a, a specific consistent situation that you're comparing. Yeah, I, I completely agree about what you said about recreational players. And I think it, it's a factor of self-awareness. So even though obviously being, being professional kind of comes with that, um, you can still in theory be a recreational player that has read all about the leading poker tiles and spoke to pros about tiles that they've seen on them. And then they can reverse tile them all the time and be complete outliers. Um, but when it comes to just people playing and not, not thinking too indefinitely, then the less experienced you are or the less that this is your profession and you've really fought into this sort of stuff, you are going to just naturally give more stuff away or not realize that saying certain things is indicative of strength or, or weakness because you haven't just got the sample size or you you just don't kind of care enough about that. You're just there to have fun and you, you just do what you're feeling at the time as opposed to thinking I need to I need to recreate this situation all the time and not, have, not be exploitable. Yeah, the other uh, one that I was... You know, it, it was the double checking of whole cards, one that I was expecting a little something from. And then the other one was the the length of time 
thinking before a bet, I, I kind of thought we'd see a little something there, but then I was thinking about it, you know, after you said you didn't find anything and I started thinking like, well, maybe that's, you know, it'd be hard to find it anyway, but I was thinking the fact that, you know, a lot of good players like to tank a long time with their good hands and their, and their, mm-hmm. and their bluffs regardless. And, and good, good players tend to take a long time in general. And I kind of wondered if that would throw off, you know, the timing averages, like that thing, again, if we were just studying, recreational players and, and you had the, the similar sample size of just recreational players, I kind of feel like there'd be a little something there, but that, anyway, that, that, that was all just stuff I was thinking of when you told me the results. Yeah. I did notice in the stream games and I, I forget the city now, is it Chicago? The wind, wind city was it? Um, oh yeah. Chicago, windy city. Yeah. Windy city. Yeah. In those games, people, people acted so quickly. Um, and it, it did, it did make it really hard to, to gather data because I wanted I wanted to use more of a breadth of not just these big tournaments and like more these were still tournaments in different environments so I thought it'd be good to have a, a wider range of players and some there was so much more often that people acted in even less than two seconds and because my whole analysis is on how long they take to make the bet it almost became mm. um, un, unused like you can't you can't get most of the factors when someone takes less than say ten seconds so I, I think I actually started excluding anything less than five seconds. Mm. Um, because it, it was you just couldn't really determine anything and and that that didn't feel so great to do either because uh, a lot of people snap bet with with bluffs or with value based mm-hmm. on what they're thinking too which you don't want to exclude from the data so it, it can change a lot based on the environment that gets into yeah another thing here where the thing about using poker tells is is applying like a player specific uh filter to it so for example if you're playing with a few people who you noticed are pretty quirky and they're like always betting quickly or doing, you know, just betting weirdly or doing other weird things. It's kind of like if you, if you can't find anything noticeable on them, you're just kind of, you're, you're not going to apply the common you know, general tells that you might apply to somebody else, another recreational mm-hmm. player to those kind of quirky, weird ones who are doing unusual things. And that kind of played into it too. And, and, and when you said that about the windy city games, which I, I used in my poker tells, series you 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 are right because there is kind of like hey uh, uh some of those games are like they they satellite it into those games from lower level uh tournaments and there can be a really uh like it's almost like a home game feel to those and and when you said that about the, yeah. those games i was like yeah now that you mention it those games are really quirky and people do all sorts of weird things and act really quick for spots you wouldn't n- typically see that for because uh, it's like like it's yeah. a lot of the same player pool and i think that kind of lends it to the this kind of like home game feel so anyway that that was just to say i think there's yeah it's it's t- it's tough to study these things basically yeah i had, I had two two lines of thought from what you just said the first was um the other thing with the Windy City games was there was a lot more times where there was not a unanimous opinion on whether it was bluff or value, because mm. um, there was a lot more times they would bet, and I would I would say they they didn't know why they were betting, or mm-hmm. even sometimes the way they turned their hand over would be that like I don't know if I win, <laughs> like <laughs> you've called I, I here's my hand I don't know <laughs> like maybe I win. <laughs> right, so you stump the expert. <laughs> well, it it just it just meant if if I don't if I know they don't know then it's harder to to get into their psychology yeah. because it's it, it, they might be almost free rolling it psycho- psychologically to think well what what they do is what they do if they're not thinking in depthly about the strategy you can't really you can't really get the same um, data from them because they, they they don't know what they're thinking right the other thing i was going to say is i because this was um my, my study was mainly focused on universal tell so i wanted i wanted a wide like a wide array of of players i i didn't get more than 10 samples on one player so out of the whole 400 and 20 data points the most i got on one player was 10 because i didn't want it to be kind of too many of one player but spread out uh, as you brought about and, and touched on already i think if you if you just looked at one player and across many situations that that would be the best way to actually determine what's what stuff they do what their tendencies are when they're bluffing or value betting and you'd very clearly see that the pros are much more balanced in, in that case mm-hmm. and a recreational player i imagine it is not uh, so having like a hundred hand sample on one player in just these spots i think would have been very interesting not as useful for universal tiles, but just to see that stuff is clearly different. Yeah, it's interesting because you know when I think about applying poker tells, so much of it is knowing which tells are likely to be true for someone you've kind of classified as a certain type of player, and then there, there's those kind of general tells for for different player segments, and then it's also like 
noticing the player specific tells for things that you wouldn't apply general tells for. So it's like, uh, I mean, there's definitely some tells that I would, I would use cold without, you know, just because they are so common, uh, assuming I, you know, pick someone as, as fairly recreational. And then there's other tells that I would never use cold where I'm like, I need to know more about this person. So it's kind of like this intersection of, uh, universal, which I think is interesting too. And then the, the player specific, which is almost like, let me study someone for a while and, yeah. and, and build up a little bit of information. That's, that's about pretty them. much what I'd say I do when I'm at the table as well. Like I'll, if someone, if the more information they give away in the hand, whether they're talking or they're like doing certain things with their body language, if the hand gets to show down, I'm like, oh, that's a that's a data point in my mm-hmm. in my memory away, about yeah. about this player. Yeah, I can't use it yet, but if they're doing something completely different in another hand, then they get to show down, and the hand is opposite. I'm like, oh, this this is already quite quite a lot of data that they've done two opposite things with two opposite ends of the spectrum of hands. And some people are really smart and can kind of duck and dive around that, but a lot of people don't realize how much they give away in the moment. Well, and the other interesting thing too, is sometimes people say like, well, you didn't get to see their hand. They didn't show it down, but in practice, you know, so many players are only making big bets with uh, value bets. So you can often mm-hmm. just assume if you've seen, even, even if you've seen them not show down, if they've made like, you know, a, only a handful of, of big bets in a, in a, in a few hours time or something, you can, you can, you can safely assume that those were value bets if they're not like, don't seem like a bluffy kind of player or whatever so there there there's even that kind of correlation you can draw which is like a little you know obviously not certain but it's kind of like in the realm of assuming it's probably true which can be helpful in some spots too yeah i was i was just going to add that it's another thing people i think forget with with river bets just based on how the parts and, and the maths works is that for example if someone bets the size of the pot the price you're, you're laying for opponent is two to one they're calling the original size of the pot to win three times the size of the pot they need to be right one in three times. So the person that bets is is supposed to have it most of the time. They're actually, mm-hmm. even even with a perfect strategy, which obviously no one has, and people are normally quite bad at bluffing or they do it too much depending on the player, but they're supposed to be making you indifferent, which means if they bet the size of the pot, they'll lay you two to one. In theory, when you, depending on obviously the different ranges and perceptions, they're, they're going to be bluffing between 60 and 70% of the time. Uh, Mm-hmm. Just as a factor of of the of the parts, no, sorry, they're, they're going to have a value at sixty seven percent of the time, so they're only going to be bluffing. Just uh, yeah, the game but, the game theory uh, fundamentals, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and yet that's what you found in your study too. It was like seventy percent value bets, right? Yeah, I can something like that. Yeah, I think I have the exact number here. Yeah, seventy one point two percent value bets across one hundred twenty hands. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't have the average bet size here, which would be really useful as well, actually, to see how to see the difference in what it should be, but it's clearly everyone just, <laughs> people always have it. That's like a, <laughs> that's always been true across pretty much every, saying, every poker yeah. environment. I was going to ask too, um, I wasn't exactly sure how to interpret it, but in, in your paper you had written that, I think you did find something, right? Like it was like dependent on controlling for a few variables. There were, there were a few things that were interesting or did I, was I misreading that? Yeah. So this is exploratory analysis, which again, I'm, I'm no, I'm no expert on on the nuance, on the nuances of how this works, and this is this is using a regression. So my my understanding is so if I, if I find one of the one of the statistically significant the results we got, um, player verbalized the bet when controlling for total turn time, bet size percentage, and if the player raised, if they were uh, if they went all in, and if they were protecting their cards. So because I have 20, 21, 22 factors, uh, twenty one independent variables. When you use the regression to see if anything's significant, it's it's kind of it's using all of them in a different way to say like it uses the data such that it, it can isolate certain variables. Whereas if you did the test just with a one-on-one variable, it would it would be different. So it's it's almost accounting for the other variables because if you've it's hard to give a direct example, but like the fact that someone raised is kind of its own um, area of data. And if you if you mm-hmm. looked at just this when they raise or just this when they don't raise, it's almost like controlling for if they raised. So if you if you kind of play around with the data and just control for specific things, then you can get statistical significance. It's it's not as useful um, because you've, in theory you could kind of cherry pick it and work around with it. And like there's there's always going to be mm. significance you can find if you if you like well no, I guess not always, but if you if you really go into every possible permutation, you're going to find significance. And um, this is one of the problems with um with papers sometimes as well is that they will. Um, 
if you don't pre-register like your hypotheses and what you're actually looking for, in theory, afterwards you could have hypothesized that the result you got was mm. the one you wanted, and then oh, this now it's a big headline right. and people are going to share it. And, uh, so yeah, I was reading something about that recently where they they were making some point about finding something completely ridiculous uh, a correlation between I can't remember what it was. It was something about like. DNA and something completely unrelated, but mm. it was to make the point that you you know for like what you're saying, you can theoretically find significance um, if you look you know across across so many different permutations and combinations. You, you're you're able to find some correlation in, in something. Yeah, the more times you you look for it, you're supposed to adjust for the fact you've looked more times because it's more likely you're going to find mm. it. So that actually affects the significance rate as well. So there's more uh, oh. more maps you're supposed to apply to it. But in, in theories, if someone doesn't pre-register the hypotheses and doesn't use correct sound science, then like if I if my if my story for this paper going into it was I'm re I'm blindsided in the fact that I think when people um, uh, let, let's take one of the random points it, when people play with their chips they're always bluffing and that, I really went into this paper thinking that and I write my whole paper such that um, I'm I'm kind of looking to prove that it's true then if if I do a test such that it doesn't come out that way. And I and I then want to like kind of move around the different data points and say, oh, what if what if this data was never recorded for? What if this data was was a uh, was controlled mm -hmm. for in this aspect? Until I find something significant and make out like that was the first test I did. In theory, I can then I can then publish a paper and and then say, yeah, this was statistically significant because of because of this. And that's why most papers today. Um, I don't know if, if all journals do this now, but I think the most reputable ones you you have to pre-submit the paper and basically mm. make sure that that can't happen. Because uh, there's too that's many good. cases in the past where people have been doing this, and so yeah, that, that's that's what we did with this paper as well. For what it's worth. Nice. Uh, so in your case, in the one you mentioned, the verbalizing bet. So that would mean that there was, depending on those other factors that you named, there was there was theoretically something there with uh, the verbalizing your bet, and maybe that points to like further study. Basically, is that is it, is that what that would tell you essentially yeah like another one here is um thinking time percentage when controlling for if the player raised and if the player went all in so already that's a really specific area that that they raised and went all in um because i think generally people take longer as well then because the it's a second decision and it's a bigger decision so it's mm. it's it's like almost going too far off the path sometimes when you when you look into these specific areas because i'm now honing in on one i'm honing in on something which is kind of a small sample and the data might be significant for this same as uh, like to give an extreme example if I controlled for if the player had the nuts obviously it's going to be really significant that they're never bluffing uh, because I'm only, I'm only looking at times where they've got the nuts mm -hmm. so um, you do kind of have to be careful with it um, but I mean it does show that, that yeah it's, there is stuff going on in some, some permutations of the tree. Uh, so are you interested in doing more in that space? Are you, are you theoretically interested in adding more to your, your uh, sample size, uh, uh, that, that uh, set of hands that you have, or, or any plans like that? I'd say that I am and I'm not at the same time. Like I, I, <laughs> I enjoyed the process a lot, and I, I really enjoyed poker psychology. It was kind of, well, I had deadlines and a time frame, and I was working on my own, so it was, it was a very different um, type of study as opposed to a full fledged study with with a lot of people at it and a lot of um, a more sophisticated team and more people to collect data like I would enjoy being a part of that I'm sure especially as like um, I don't want to say poker expert but I guess in that in that context that's what I would be because I because mm -hmm. I've played professionally for so long but I'd be happy to be involved in, and help out in these studies as they go forward or potentially have more of a role depending on the opportunity but I think if, if like new technology comes out where there's new ways to analyze the data or it becomes easier or there's there's new ways to think about it where there's a lot more we can learn in a different way like that could reignite my interest as well or i think um as you spoke about i really like the idea of someone creating a game which is the psychology poker game and oh sorry just to go back to one of the hurt we we're speaking about hurdles um the problem initially with this is if you bring people into a lab to play poker it, the data is almost worthless because they don't have any risk like it's like i've played play money with, with people before and it's not poker it's right, right. <laughs> it's it's Unless you have like a, a league or like something that, that that means something, people just don't care. They've got to they've got to have their own risk. And I really like the idea of um, if hypothetically I I had infinite money to make this study, 
I can put on like uh, a big tournament, whether it's a league or whatever, have like some pros, have some maybe athletes, have like some famous famous uh, people in different areas or purely recreational players and just analyze as much data as possible, but just give away actual prizes as well, like prize money that's, that means something to people or like a title mm-hmm. and a trophy. Mm-hmm. And like it's, it becomes kind of prestigious to be able to win this, uh, this game where uh, maybe it's um, one table of six max every week uh, and we record uh, like heart rate, we record uh, breathing rate, we record uh, like the eye shiftiness Sk- directly. Skin conductance. Rate. Yeah, yeah. Like as as many things as you can possibly record without being too intrusive, such that like people can still relax enough to play the game and gather all the data as possible, and then kind of have. Uh, I, mean, I can imagine if people if people if we recorded this and people watched it, you could have experts generally saying like that this this is leading to this. We can say that this is more likely because of this, or here's the science behind this, and. I think it'd be. I would find something like that really fascinating to watch as a poker player. So I imagine other people would find it interesting. No, I think it's a great idea, and I think it's like using the entertainment factor as a as almost like an excuse to do the science because you yeah. you're you're creating that real environment, and uh, that that's what I was struggling with too because I actually I, I spent a good few weeks brainstorming this a while back in Portland where I was. You know, because it was that same challenge of like, you, it needs to be real, obviously, but then like, what am I gonna? What am I doing to? induce people to be willing to do this on, on a, with a bunch of cameras and detectors and stuff. And it's like, I would have to pay them a good amount. So it, it, it for many reasons, it, it, it had a lot of obstacles, but I think your, your uh, idea is great because it would, it would be using the, the entertainment and the, and the money involved that, that, that would come with that to, to do some cool science. And actually there was, I don't know if you ever saw that show that I can't remember what it was called. It was very short lived, a small edit here. I talked a little bit about a poker TV show here that I couldn't remember the name of. In the show, they had recorded the players' heart rates. The show I was thinking of was from 2006. It was called Poker Dome Challenge, and it was only on air, I think, a few weeks. Back to the interview. All I remember was that it was only a few episodes, I think, and they and they recorded, I think it was heart rate, but maybe it was something else. But does that ring a bell at all with the heart rate? I've definitely seen. I mean, I've seen streamers do it now, but they have their heart rate on the screen. Oh, you while, have? While, yeah, while while they're um, they're playing, and I've seen. I like, haven't seen um, that. There's a guy called BBZ. I've seen him use it on his streams where his heart rate gets to like one, 140, 150 when he's doing a huge bluff in like a 10k tournament. You can oh. see it see it going up. <laughs> oh, I, like it's. Uh, I haven't seen that. Okay, I gotta I gotta check that out because yeah, I, I always thought it would be cool to to wear those uh, you know monitors on your on yourself mm-hmm. when you go to play or when you're playing at home or wh- whatever. Uh, yeah, I think that stuff is really interesting. And you can also buy like the EKG skin conductance things too if you really wanted to get into that. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, maybe as a starting point, hypothetically, if there's a game that already runs, then imagine if you could say to those people before they play, like, we're doing this this study. Do you, do you want to have, have your data measured? I don't know what incentive you can necessarily give people. Um, but if we could start to get data from that, from games that already exist before creating a full-fledged game, that seems like a good kind of stepping stone. Like, I, I would be happy to do that. I'd be interested in how my own physiology reacts when I'm playing if, if the whole cards and everything's already streamed. Totally, yeah. No, and if there's anybody listening who's into that idea um contact me or or and or brandon we'll look into it uh and i think it it's interesting too thinking about the um how ai machine learning video detection stuff can play into this too because you can imagine Mm -hmm. uh like usually heart rate can be kind of hard to see but you can imagine like hooking up something where it's like recording some a specific person's heart rate or even um, indicators of like uh, flushing, you know, um, in a very, at a very uh, minute detail level and then like correlating that in, in some way and noticing things that wouldn't be obvious to people. And, and that's, that's something I think is interesting too, because, you know, for example, there was a recent Israeli uh, study that found um, facial movements, uh, pretty high frequency ability to detect deception by uh, minute facial movements, detect when people were lying, which struck me as like these kinds of things that are, are not obvious to human eyes, but that a like a video recognition uh, AI could pick up. It gets into a kind of a scary area where it's like you can imagine somebody making some really awesome advancement and using that to really uh, take advantage of that at the poker tables without anybody knowing. Because if you had something like that, that would that would be a way I would be using you know, some advanced technology like that if I if I was trying to make the most money and willing to cheat, basically, you know. Uh, so it's it's something yeah, it's something like some, to think about. Some super glasses. 
Yeah, I, I was going to say that it, I know I know you're saying like it'd be really cool if an AI detected all of these extra features of someone's face, the stuff we don't see. I actually think there's there's a lot of stuff that we pick up subconsciously because if you when you're playing, if you look at someone, it's almost like you can you can't pinpoint why, but you can just sense discomfort sometimes, mm -hmm. or sense comfort, and you can't you won't be able to put it into words like it's because of X, Y, and Z, but. Well, this, this is kind of it's kind of an ongoing debate in the psychology world that we have an area of our brain that is either really really good at de at just detecting objects or it's really really good at detecting faces mm. and we don't know if it's either that we see so many faces that that's why we're so good at determining faces or that we have a specific area for faces and it's still kind of up for contention but either way we're we are much better at reading faces than we realize mm -hmm. we pick up so many soul cues as well just as, as humans even if we can't uh, we can't document it. And it would be really cool to see, um, to pinpoint that into a big AI super learning machine that just says, you just tell it it's bluffing. You just say, like, watch this guy's face for, yeah. for like this period of time. And it's just, it, it comes out by, you can plug in the next data and it's like, yep, they're bluffing. Yep, they're not bluffing or undetermined. No, totally. I think there is, I mean, you know, and I think that is not far away. They have an app for, you know, analyzing video for various things. And you could plug that into some machine learning stuff and, and study a bunch of footage. You know, they have these black box machine learning things that can just spit out correlations and uh, you don't really know how it's working. And I think that's, that's, that's stuff that I think you could theoretically do now if, if you were so inclined. And I think like you were saying, it's like, the, the things that uh, we often don't notice consciously or, or just don't notice at all are these kind of like so when someone's relaxed, they might have little tiny micro movements that are not really that mm -hmm. obvious to us, but that might stand out as like the things that we pick up as a feeling or a vibe are things that the machine would be able to, yeah. to get down to a really fine grain detail, like very exact. Yeah. The only issue is just going to be similar to to my study is sample size like i know that how poker solvers work they, they play against each themselves millions of times mm -hmm. i don't know how many times you'll have to input someone doing this like river action or whatever before it can it can be statistically significantly correct like often right that many percent that much percentage of the time it, it might need hundreds of thousands or millions of, of bits of data I, I guess if we did create hypothetically in this like parallel world if we we had infinite money to just make this game then You'd have like, you'd have the camera exactly on everyone's face, such that mm -hmm. they don't, they can't move between so far or like they, they, you can always see their entire face, and you get a pretty big sample pretty quick just doing that because every time it, if you record everyone's face in every game and they play every day for six hours, then that mm -hmm. you can start building a sample pretty quick. That obviously not compared to the numbers you, you might need, it would take a very long time. But if there was more games and more more people doing that, then that'd be a really good starting point. So it sounds like we need multiple numbers of these games set up around the world uh going uh 24 hours a day so yeah we'll, we'll get started on that um so i wanted to ask you too with uh are, are there any tells that stand up to you that you use live when it when it comes to you know maybe a recent hand you played where a tell was uh made a decision for you anything anything stand out in that regard um definitely yes i try not to face i, I won't ever I, I say never it's very rare that i'll make a super super exploit based purely on a tell i'd have to be i'd have to be really confident um which is a very very rare situation it's like a dangerous place to be if you're, if you're so confident in something like that but it, it does happen very i mean if I, I play a lot of hands and it's it's very very rare that will happen but obviously we're about going i won't go directly into like this means this because then people are going to probably start <laughs> i'm going to get leveled <laughs> very easily next time i see that oh <laughs> uh, yeah but, i hear you i hear um, you i got you i mean there, there also isn't a direct Thing. I, I can give you one actually. Um, I'll give you two examples that come to mind from playing in the last 12 months. There's one where I had a friend who's a very good online player, and I know he was new to the, the live poker game, but he's a very good theoretical player. And um, there's something uh, which I, I call Card Apex, um, which I, I can't remember if you also if you also wrote about it, but I've, I've seen it in a few places. Which is when when you look at your hand for the first time, if you if you see that it's like aces or kings or like a really good hand you put it you naturally put it down quickly because it's like uh your body's like oh <laughs> like shit mm -hmm. good hand <laughs> like uh pe people just put it down quicker whereas if you see more of a marginal decision where you need to think about it people look at it for longer so if you see a jack 10 suited jack 9 suited ace 5 suited like something which is you want to play but it might be dependent on the action whereas compared to a hand that you're always playing no matter what people tend to look at it a little bit longer and 
Mm -hmm. I, I played a hand where I'd, I'd raised first to act and this guy was on the button and he looked at his hand and he was still looking at it for like a few seconds and I was watching him and they put it down and then he re-raised <laughs> and then it came back to me and uh, I had like the worst hand I could possibly have so I, I was like I really want to just go all in here but it feels so like if I'm wrong I'm just I'm just a complete idiot and I'm really sure that this this is um, <laughs> that he's bluffing based on this one tap but Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know it would it would still be too out of line for me to go in with this hand. If I had a hand I'm supposed to bluff here with, sometimes I'd just do it every time. Like that's how it how it calibrate. I wouldn't then go all in with a hand I should never go in with, just to control mm -hmm. my frequencies. And so I I just said to him, "You're bluffing, aren't you? I'm so sure you're bluffing here. Please show me." And I folded, and he, he showed me it was bluffing. Um, <laughs> so that that's just like one 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 nice one, which can be quite reliable for people. That no, are. I like that one. I like that one a lot. I I, I read that I read about that a good amount, and I, and I talk about. Um... Yeah, the, the the kind of psychological reasons behind that. I think I wrote a good amount of that in in, uh, in uh, exploiting poker tells my last one, and I I will use that one a good amount to decide, you know, whether to, to um, like three bet somebody light mm. pre flop, like if they raise and like they're and they stare at their cards a little bit longer than than normal, you know, at longer than average, like that. I'll I'll use that as a decision point to, uh, you know, make a make a a loose uh, a loose or three bet. Yeah, I like think that. I think it can be a really nice one, but it's. The more important part is like, like, like my decision process there. It's that I don't know he's bluffing there. Like it's a strong indicator, so I can I can use that to to make small exploits by saying, let's say I, I fall bet, I fall bet all in as mm -hmm. a bluff there with, I don't know five percent of hands. Maybe that's not the right number, but instead I go to five point five, and all the hands that I'm supposed to mix, I just always use. And maybe there's one hand which I don't use that I then use, but I'm, as soon as I start just going all in with everything there, you, it's it just it feels like it's. Um, it's too far away from um, it's too like much a, a, a strategy so to speak like the example you just gave i think it's it's a great indicator but you don't just re-raise the seven two offsuit because it's <laughs> no exactly because you they're they're, they're still going to call you mm. some percentage of time or whatever they're yeah it's not it's not a um and like you said it's not it's far from certain anyway it's just making it slightly more or or even significantly more likely and, and but yeah you're right it's you have to keep in the, the factors of, of what's good yeah, good play too. Uh, the, way, the way I talk about it uh, is you've got to give weightings to your assumptions. So my assumptions in some spots are, are not worth much because I don't know much about the player, I don't have much info, but in other spots they're worth a bit more. And this this is an example where based on my history of playing with people and the psychology I've read behind it, my assumption that that meant he was bluffing is worth something. It's not worth everything, but it just allows me mm -hmm. to expand my range a little bit. And the other example that came to my head was a hand I played in Vegas against someone who was who was a recreational player um, to some extent. I think he was like probably had a job, but was just out for the World Series and like he, he plays poker for fun. But he's not like necessarily terrible. But he's not professional. There's a hand where I raised with Ace King, and he called in the big blind. Uh, we're going to po poker technical, I guess. Uh, I I had bet on seven seven six two with a flush draw, and I, I just have Ace King, and he raised. So this is a point I know where I, I always continue with Ace King against someone that raises correctly. But I, my assumption tells me he's not raising correctly because he's not a professional. He's not going to know which bluffs to use. And it's quite counterintuitive to find some of the bluffs. But I've seen some people easily overdo it too, but I've not seen him do anything crazy. So my head's playing back all these different features. Like, do I defend my ace-king versus the raise? Maybe he's always got two power a set and I'm just losing loads of money. Or maybe maybe I'll just keep him honest for one street and then overfold the turn. And I just started staring at him. And it was just clear that he was he was uncomfortable. And I can't necessarily explain why, but something about his like his eyes and the way he held his movement and everything. Because I'd seen him play a few more hands where he had good hands. And just His body language was just completely different. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, it was almost enough for me to say, I'm, no, I'm not going to fold this hand at any point unless his body language changes. And <laughs> if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Mm. I'll, I'll like die by the sword at this point. I'm so, I'm so confident <laughs> in the fact this guy doesn't look comfortable. Mm. And, That's confident. Uh, so I called the turn was nicely a two, so nothing changed. And then he, he bet again and it was the same story. And I went as far as to, I made my, I don't know if this actually made a difference, but I tried to make myself look as weak as possible when I called the turn because I really wanted mm -hmm. him to bluff the river. Induce. Um, so I, re yeah, I really made it look more. like, hmm, like really begrudging call, like, ah, oh, this is a close spot for me. And then when he, I got the best river in the, well, one of the best rivers in the deck, another two. <laughs> so every single bluff became the same hand by the river. Mm -hmm. uh, and he went all in and, and I called and he had like a, he had a, a really strong bluff. He had like an open-ended straight flush draw, but it would have been really easy for me to just o overfold that that flop against the other players or overfold yeah. the turn without that extra. I think he's uncomfortable, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go closer to theory here. 
that's a real interesting one. But I couldn't I couldn't pinpoint like his his hand was in this place or he yeah. had this brief right whatever it was. It's like a combination of lots of things. Yeah, I was gonna say it gets into that like you were saying like there's sometimes there may be things that we feel that may be based on for example you no subconsciously noticing something about how he was acting in previous mm. hands that was you know say like his eye contact uh was completely different mm. that didn't really consciously register to you uh but I, you know because i think eye contact's really big and, and an underrated uh behavior but yeah it's it, it's some of these things can be things that we're kind of slightly aware of which gets into that realm of you know i actually had a really good interview with brian rast about this kind of stuff about poker tells and he was talking yeah, about how i, he, I like brian rust he, yeah he's he, he's great I, I respect him a lot poker wise and um yeah he was talking about the fact that he plays like these um draw he was talking about playing draw games and the fact that there's so little information in draw games and so a lot of it comes down to these like well do i feel one way or other about this you know there's a lot of these borderline spots where you're put in where you're like well this could go either way and, and, and more in than other games uh, cause you have less information. And he was, he was saying, you know, he, he really does trust those, those feelings sometimes. And, and that he thinks that's a, a source of a, of a big edge where you're just like, I, I just feel like, even if I can't put my finger on it, I think this guy's, this guy's bluffing or this guy's got it this time. Yeah. Yeah. I think especially in the single draw games where it's decision, draw, decision, the hands over, then mm -hmm. you get mm -hmm. so much less information about how to range your opponents. And that becomes a much bigger component of the, the strategy you use. Well, this has been great. Uh, anything else you wanted to, to throw in here before we uh, signed off? Uh, I guess that the only other thing we, we didn't touch on, that just so I had one note on, was um, determining player skill, like um, like a way to do that. I was just going to mention that I was going to use Hendon Mob as a reference point to say, for example, if someone has 10 million in caches um, and they're playing a 5,000 pound buy-in, it'd be good to use that as a metric to say, obviously, that I played a lot of big tournaments and maybe the amount of total caches they've got could go into that and we could have a formula and a rating so you could have mm. a degree of live professional poker player based on that and there was a lot of problems with it because if someone is a businessman with millions of pounds and plays high rollers and then wants to play a smaller tournament it might bias the data but i'm sure there's a way to do it to make it uh correlated to, to skill level so mm -hmm. i mean that'd be really good to incorporate into future studies if we could if we could create it some sort of system of recreational to pro maybe a scale of one to ten and then we could use that to determine how useful some of the data is or to see if there is a, a lot more um indicators when it comes to more recreational players which i think we both agree is it's intuitive that that makes makes sense that it's true yeah that sounds great because even if it wasn't perfect it would still be something that you could filter through yeah yeah i guess other than that i just wanted to say thanks um you helped me determine the hypotheses of this study you helped me um you helped me kind of plan it out in a really nice way and incorporate much better science in some ways, learn from past mistakes of other studies. Like I, I didn't know so much about the other poker study that happened in the past, the, the sleeping one, but uh, as we touched on today, there was some issues with it. And I think uh, my study became the next step from there in some ways, like we, we improved on a lot of uh, the problems of that. And it's going to make for better science in the future for the next study in this space. Uh, yeah, you reading your, your books and speaking to you helped me help me learn a lot about the space and make a lot of good decisions when it comes to when it came to studying it and reporting the data so thanks yeah thanks brian no i appreciate you saying that and uh, yeah thanks for talking to me and um look forward to seeing what else you do yeah thanks for coming on no problem thanks again that was a talk with brandon shields you can find him on his youtube channel which is titled brandon shields or on twitter at brandon shields again his last name is spelled s-h-e-i-l-s if you're interested in poker, you might like to check out my Poker Tells work, which you can learn about at readingpokertells.com and readingpokertells.video. If you like this podcast, I'd very much appreciate you sharing it on social media and giving it a rating on iTunes or another platform. You can learn more about this podcast at behavior-podcast.com. You can follow me on Twitter at the handle apokerplayer. Thanks for listening. Music by Small Skies.